Okay, let's get started. So, hi everybody and welcome. My name is Steve. I'm part of the team here at Lab Voice, and I want to thank you for joining our presentation today. The Caterpillar and the Butterfly, How to Avoid the Trap of Digital Modernization in R&D. So before getting started, I'll quickly introduce our speaker. So Roger Shaw is a managing partner and co-founder of Digital Lab Consulting. Roger has over 25 years experience working across a range of technologies and domains within life sciences and healthcare, and is passionate about helping companies transform their business through better use of informatics. Roger, on behalf of the Lab Voice team, thank you for presenting today. I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, um, and the Lab Voice team. So um, today I'm going to take a short look at digital transformation in R&D, um, specifically looking at how um, data standards are used to support that process. Um, and we'll look at some of the lessons learned um, that, that we hear and see from working with our clients. So if we look at the existing scientific ecosystem, um, you know, it's evolving all the time. And if we have a look back at you know, where it's come from, um, it was very much an environment where companies innovated, uh, everything was done internally, their data was managed internally, um, and there was very little external externalization of their, their work. If we look at where companies are today, um, there's really a, a, a hybrid. There's much more externalization. Companies are looking at different ways of, of innovating. Um, data is held both internally and externally and companies are, are really struggling to, to work out how to manage the security and trust between organizations. And if we look at how things are moving in the future, um, we really see um, a real heterogeneity of collaborations, part of a, a much wider ecosystem of uh, companies um, using a combination of cloud and digital technologies and a and a distributed data environment. And I think with uh, the, the, the global pandemic that we're seeing today, we think that that's going to really accelerate and we can also already see companies that are um, starting to break down some of those barriers. But digital transformation is a topic that, that, that attracts a lot of hype. Um, there are lots of expectations around digital transformation from uh, increasing productivity, providing a foundation for AI, um, providing better scientific satisfaction for the scientists. And I think a fairly big statement that we've seen is that McKinsey believes that disruption um, enabled by the types of digital technologies that we're starting to see on the market can deliver a hundred billion dollars worth of value across the industry over the next decade. So it's no surprise that people are really focusing on, on how they can leverage digital transformation. So I thought it would be useful just to, to set the scene just around digitalization. Um, as I say, it meant, means different things to different people. Um, first of all, digitalization is not the same as digitization. So when people talk about digitization, it's about um, the, the old fashioned scanning of documents but, um, and storage of electronic documents, but there's very little context, a very little ability to leverage structured data within, within those documents. And it's a very time consuming process. But as things have developed, really the first step of um, digital transformation is the adoption of electronic systems such as ELNs, um, LES, uh, LIMS that are allowing companies to store more structured contextualized data um, and providing some level of foundation for um, the kind of transformation that companies are, are looking at today. And this was a real step forward from, from 
um, the digitization uh, days, uh, but still um, some of those systems are very time consuming, very manual, uh, labor intensive um, systems. So when we talk about uh, digitalization, uh, we're looking at then how do you connect all of those things together? How do you connect those new electronic applications with the data, the people, the process, and leverage some of the new technologies that are coming into the market to fundamentally change the way that we, we work, to break down some of those silos across R&D and to enable things like AI, machine learning, and, and, and the type of lab automation that companies are seeking to do. So you've probably seen lots of uh, different terms when, when it comes to um, digital transformation. You'll have heard of digital lab, lab of the future, lab 4.0, e-lab, i-lab, future lab. Um, uh, not entirely sure where uh, lab 2 and lab 3 went, but we seem to have gone straight to, straight to lab 4. Um, and these all conjure up sort of images of people uh, working in labs using virtual reality and Google, Google Glass and using smart lab equipment. Um, but there are some clear expectations of what people realistically are, are looking towards in, in the lab of the future. So let's take a look at some of those. So we have um, electronic data capture. So this is the, the, the types of systems, the new modern systems for capturing, um, you know, like lab notebooks and LES and EBR, electronic batch records and, and, and LIM systems. We have data standards underpinning everything. Um, and I'll talk about those shortly. We have connectivity and mobility. So, um, new technology and tools, um, systems delivered in the cloud, or um, voice activated systems like those used by the lab voice uh, team. Uh, advanced technologies, so providing uh, artificial intelligence, augmented analytics, um, insight engines, delivering uh, data to the fingertips of scientists, and that scientific ecosystem with companies working with, with external, external part, partners. And I think, you know, some of this seems very far-fetched. Um, I think there's been a lot of advance. We're seeing a lot of advancement at the moment, uh, but for many companies, these seem uh, a, a long way off. Um, you know, we've got an example where, um, but this is coming, and I think we've got a we've got an example where one of my colleagues, um, his school had a virtual reality day, and um, they spent the whole day looking at looking at the different different technologies and have visitors, and that, and that might sound, um, you know, not too unusual uh, until you realise that he was only five, and we have a we have a whole a whole. Um, a whole population coming through who are going to be working in uh, in companies in the future, and this is really going to help drive um, you know, drive where we get to. But the lab of the present today, I think you know we see that labs, although there's a lot of improvement, labs are really lagging behind. Um, and but we hear a consistent theme now when we speak to uh, companies, and it's that we want to do AI. And often, you know, we've got real experience of sitting down with, with, with team members where, you know, one of, the, one of the management team or their boss has been to a conference and they've come back and said, yeah, I want to do AI. There's no context, but we just want to do AI. And it's something we're hearing more and more. But what do you need to do to, to do AI? Well, to do things like AI, you have to have very clear um, computational techniques, you have to have clear unambiguous data that are able to generate reliable results and and this is this is an example we we like to use, which was um, a result of scientists submitting data to um, the EBI regarding 
uh, samples uh, and they were asked to indicate whether the samples were male or female and this gives you an example of all the different types of data that they were they were storing within their um, yeah, within their system and uh, yeah particularly like this um, this example where scientists have completely gone over the top in terms of um, recording recording data so to respond to to problems like this um, you know there are standards like fair which I'm sure many people have, have heard about now and this is getting a lot of um, a lot of interest and a lot of buy-in now from commercial organizations and one of the things that we we often recommend and we we we, we talk to with with our clients is that you look at yourselves and your business and ask yourselves you know how fair are you um, look at uh, how findable accessible interoperable and reusable your data is within your organization um, one of the things that's that, that that's quite interesting and um, uh, there was a recent report from the European Commission which they they managed to to produce um, when they weren't negotiating Brexit with the UK um, where they looked at the cost of not having fair data um, across the European economy um, and there's some quite incredible data that that goes with that and it was found that the cost of not having fair research data cost the European economy 10.2 billion every single year and if you also combine that with um, the resulting impact and delays on on research that exceeds over 26 billion euros a year so this is a really really serious topic um, that's 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 being looked at um, ac across the globe so when you're looking at fair for for, for your part of your digitalization strategy it's really important to look at um, the use of data standards and what we recommend is um, taking approach to something we call data landscaping which consists of two key parts one is looking very closely at your data inventory so having a look at the data that exists within your organization and your departments looking at where it's stored looking at the type of data and, and looking at how that's accessed within your organization and as part of doing that we also recommend that you also look at the data flows within your organization so have a look at where that data comes from um, who or what you know what department what 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 equipment generates that data how is it used or consumed in your organization um, and as part of that you get the opportunity to also look at how that data um, is used as part of a, an organizational process and you have the opportunity to look at how uh, you can potentially op optimize the flow of data in in your organization and remove bottlenecks or look at opportunities to harmonize processes across your organization so if we come back to, then to uh, data standards so um, it's really important to understand uh, when looking at data standards, what are the areas in your organization that are holding you back from achieving the goals that you 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 want to achieve? So what are the things that are furthest away from you? And what are the things that you need to prioritize as an organization when selecting standards? Uh, unless you know those things, it's very difficult to make sure that you you're choosing the right standards for for, for your organization. As an example, um, we picked a couple of picked a couple of examples. Um, you know, if, if as an organisation your um, yeah you know, your your main issue is around data integration, so that might be integrating data between different systems, different equipment, um, different departments. Then a real focus on clean, unambiguous data and fair compliance is is the thing that you're you're looking at. If you're looking at working externally um, with with organizations uh, or if you're looking to optimize process transfer internally and externally 
then looking at standards like ISA 88 um, uh, can be important for your organization. So, and there are lots of different standards available, um, many of which you will have heard of that are produced from the Allotrope Foundation, from Pistoia, Animal, ISA 88, as I, I, I mentioned. Um, but it's really, really important to make sure that you, you understand what it is you're trying to achieve um, when you're selecting the correct data standards. Um, and we're looking at uh, one of the things you might want to do, we're going to be publishing a, a blog on that more closely. One of my colleagues um, will be doing that and um, you can take a look at that over the next couple of weeks. So what do we recommend as, a, as an organisation? What are the things to, um, to consider when embarking on the digitalisation strategy? Um, first of all, we recommend uh, making sure that you have an overall strategy um, for your organisation. I think it's, you know, it's, it's very, very important. Um, we often see companies that are struggling to to focus on what they need to do and where they need to start. So putting together an overall strategy with the key, uh, key aspects that are going to be looked at, um, looking at that from a company wide perspective, uh, looking at not only the data, but also looking at the technology, the people, the processes and, and the applications that will be used across um, the, the, the organization. Uh, making sure that you have well-defined goals uh, and also looking at how those technology investments um, that you're looking to make will impact, make a real tangible impact on, uh, on the business. Um, so I mentioned making, making sure you have a strong focus on data standards within, within your company and really focusing on data quality and data integrity to make sure that any technology that you do put in place has a has a firm sound foundation for, um, for, for success. And, and very strongly we recommend making sure that fair principles are at the core of everything that you, you do and the decisions that you make around data within your organization. So you may wonder where the caterpillar comes from. Well, this is one of our favorite quotes. Um, when digital transformation is done right, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But when it's done wrong, all you end up with is a really fast caterpillar. So I'd like to thank you very much for a short presentation. Um, thanks very much to the Lab Voice team for um, setting aside the time for me to present. And I'd like to welcome any questions from uh, the audience and people participating.